Welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. Um, this week, I'm going to be joined by two of my really uh, wonderful colleagues, Dan Diker of the Jerusalem Institute of Public of Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and Professor Avi Bell from Bar Ilan University and University of San Diego. Um, and we're going to be talking about the uptick in the BDS operation against Israel on U.S. college campuses. Um, but I think uh, before we begin our discussion, I just want to mention, you know, we're uh, recording this show uh, the week after or a few days after we had a uh, barbarous uh, terrorist attack uh, where three Jews were hacked to death by axe wielding jihadists in the ultra orthodox city of of El Ad. Um, and this follows uh, a long uh, uh, list of terrorist attacks in Tel Aviv in Bnei Brak in Beersheba. Um, and, and in uh, Hadera, and then weeks and weeks of incitement and, and violence and terrorism by Muslims who were incited uh, by uh, imams, directed by Hamas, directed by the Jordanian government, directed by the Palestinian Authority in places like the Temple Mount, Joseph's Tomb in Nablus, and other places uh, throughout Israel and throughout the Palestinian authorities in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza. Um, so we are in a sort of, uh, I don't know whether it's a spasm, but certainly an uptick in massive incitement, the kinds that we haven't really seen uh, for years since we were in the midst of the Palestinian terrorist war against Israel, uh, which started in 2000. Um, and uh, at the same time that this is happening, very reminiscent of what was going on 20, 22 years ago, uh, we're seeing an uptick in anti-Semitic and anti-Israel activism, on the left in its focal points in the media and in academia and including in, in the Biden administration. So we're, we're experiencing this, this uh, uptick and we wanna talk today specifically about the escalation or the seeming escalation, whether it is an escalation or not, we're gonna discuss of uh, BDS activism, of anti-Israel condemnations, uh, in academia, in the universities. We saw both at University of Sydney and at University of Melbourne uh, in Australia over the past week, uh, uh, resolutions to uh, boycott Israel, Israel academia, to side with the Palestinians in their terror war against Israel were passed at both campuses. And then notably, uh, Harvard's Crimson, its uh, student newspaper came out with a very strong, uh, very pernicious, uh, editorial, unsigned editorial, uh, essentially, side, not essentially, very actively siding uh, with the boycott of Israel with the Palestine Solidarity Committee, which is an organization that seeks the annihilation of Israel, um, and also ascribed uh, incredible bravery to anybody who would stand up to the cabal uh, that controls free speech in the United States, of course, that is the Jews, uh, and how brave you must be in order to stand up to that, um, because you know now being anti-Semitic is so hard on university campuses. So I think uh, maybe we should start with the contents of the editorial in the Crimson and talk about what's going on at Harvard. All three of us, by the way, uh, our uh, Harvard graduates, uh, uh, among our other sins. Um, and, so, uh, and so we're gonna talk about that as well and whether the things have changed or how much they've changed since we left 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, now I'm gonna let you see my guests so that you know that I'm not just lying. So here we're in the gallery view of Zoom. Hey, Avi, hey, Dan, good to have Hi, you. Hi, Carolyn, good morning. So why don't we just open it up first with a question. Um, the Harvard, the Harvard editorial really stunned a lot of people. You had uh, liberal Jews uh, on the left, like Alan Dershowitz and Lawrence Summers, a former pre president of Harvard, who was thrown out actually by the woke crowd uh, back 20 years ago from his position, uh, both coming out with op-eds against what they've done. Um, but uh, you also have Jews on Harvard campus, including one of the editors of the Crimson. One was against it, and another one said, I'm I'm Jewish and I signed on to this editorial. Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves, uh, what are we looking at? Is this, a, is, this an, is this an escalation? Is this an acceleration of uh, anti-Israel campus operations? How, how do you guys look at it? 
Um, who should I start with? Let me start with uh, Dan. Uh, you wrote an op-ed about it also at JNS.org. Yeah, very, uh, very much. So actually, I wrote uh, for Israel Ayom. Uh, I wrote an op-ed just hours within um, within its taking place. I just want to mention what an honor it is to be here with Professor Bell, who's uh, been a colleague and a teacher of mine for a number of years on a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's terrific to be with you, Carolyn and, and Avi. Let me just try to create for uh, a minute, minute and 20 seconds, some uh, a little bit of historic uh, context here. Uh, Harvard has been on a slippery, sliding slope, a sliding slope all into a, a type of, of de-evolution of, um, of liberal thinking into progressive and radical thinking, uh, which has infected the campus um, over the last uh, 15 years. I remember uh, back in 2012, uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard University hosted something called a one state solution conference at the Harvard K School. Offering, when was this? Uh, when was this? Back in 2012, when I served as the International Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress, uh, um, uh, and I led a, at that time, I led a, a, a very uh, outspoken protest against Harvard University lending its official name um, and, and, and infrastructure. They, kept, they lent the Kennedy School um, to what they called a one state solution, um, a conference that was essentially a, a carnival of hatred against the existence of, of, of Israel. They didn't understand it then. They didn't understand that the word solution was used back in the 1940s as a final solution, and this was the one state solution. And we've just gone further further south uh, since then. I was in touch with President Bacow uh, two years ago, having written on behalf of the Harvard Club of Israel, a very strong letter of condemnation of the fact that the, that the Harvard Undergraduate Council awarded more than $2,000 in 2019 for the Israel Apartheid Week, which is uh, a, a clearly uh, another carnival of hatred representing the Nazification uh, of Israel. And uh, President Bacow wrote a letter back saying there was nothing he could do. This was an expression of academic freedom at Harvard. And if they were to outlaw or prohibit uh, the Israel Apartheid Week, uh, what would that mean for any minority that, that wanted to hold a, um, you know, a, a conference uh, um, under the rubric of, of freedom of expression on campus and freedom of speech. So I don't, know, can you, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but can you think of another minority? I mean, I'm not sure what a minority is. Is this the uh, Arab minority of Israel? Is this the Arab minority in the land of Israel? But is there another minority that's uh, asking to host a or does host a month or a week or a day or an hour of protests calling for the annihilation of the majority of whatever country is involved is there another is there another example uh that uh that uh, he could point to did i mean can you think of can either of you think of no. an, another example of something like this? No, in fact, in fact, uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz uh, wrote yesterday, uh, wrote uh, uh, on uh, May May the sixth in a stinging at a, uh, in a stinging counter op-ed against uh, the Crimson, um, uh, uh, the Harvard Crimson newspaper, full-throated endorsement of the Palestine Solidarity Committee and the BDS movement um, that this is the only pro uh, pro Palestine, as they call it or it's the only pro movement in the world that's based on the annihilation of another people. Um, so that, that, that would be the answer to the question. I don't think, unless Avi has it, finds another example, there's no other example in the world of a, uh, of a pro uh, uh, um, movement uh, for any uh, national group or, or um, you know, attempted to, uh, an attempt to argue for a national group that's based on the, on the, uh, the politicide or the genocide of another, of another people. Okay, um, so so having said that, um, Avi, you know, you also teach at University of San Diego, and you're on U.S. college campuses at least one semester of the year. But you do a lot of work, uh, not only as a professor in the U.S. but also uh, as a lecturer. Um, do you see an acceleration, or how do you view this sudden apparent uptick where you have? Uh, a student newspaper, which, you know, the, the Crim Crimson even acknowledged that, I think it was two, two decades ago, probably after the Durban conference, I don't know, they opposed as an editorial board uh, BDS, and now they're turning around, and not only do they support BDS, they support it in a way that makes clear that they support the annihilation of Israel, and that uh, they think that uh, uh, trying to in any way limit the aspirations 
or the goals of the Palestinian Arabs against Israel is a form of censorship and it's evidence of a Jewish lobby or uh, that's uh, trying to censor speech. Um, do you see an acceleration here? Or what do you think is going on? I, it, there clearly is an interesting social phenomenon going on here where anti-Semitism is getting more popular on college campuses. I think the Crimson illustrates it, but it's it's not a it's not a straight line. It, the, the Crimson editorial is a very very interesting uh, uh, piece, and it's an interesting piece because it, while it calls it calls for economic discrimination against most of the world's Jews, and it does so on the basis of all these illusions, uh, uh, anti-Semitic illusions to uh, insidious Jewish power and the evil of the Jewish state and the wanton cruelty of Jews. Um, but it, it doesn't do any of these things um, directly. It, it, it calls for a boycott of the world's Jews, but it never defines the terms BDS. It assumes that everybody knows that. It, um, it incorporates by reference um, uh, a display by the, the Palestinian Solidarity Committee and the, uh, uh, their display on the so-called Israel Apartheid Week. Art, that, they uh, call it art, right? They say art, 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 right. You know, it, it's Jew hating art. It's art about in which it makes claims about wanton Jewish cruelty and wanton Jewish evil and the evil of Jews individually and as a collective. Um, but it doesn't say any of those things either. Um, a, a lot of the, the Crimson editorial extols their own bravery for being allowing themselves to be exposed to criticism for being bigots. Um, um, and it's it's clear, as Dershowitz wrote, that um, what we're to understand that the evil Jews control so much power that they're going to punish punish the Crimson editorial board for uh, exp publicly expressing their bigotry against Jews, even though we know, un unfortunately, um, there's going to be little price. Um, but all that tells you something, because this, this, ed this editorial is more than anything, it's, it's not an argument, it's, it's an exercise in virtue signaling, right? Um, it's, it's written in order to tell the crowd that they're interested in, that we're on your side against the Jews. Now, why would they think so? And I think that's because there's an atmosphere on college campuses, at least among a certain crowd, let's call them the woke crowd or the diversity crowd, that uh, tells us that anti-Semitism is a core part of fighting for justice. A just society is one that punishes whites and punishes Jews. Um, um, that upholds the rights of, of the transgender and um, a, a variety of other ethnic groups that have uh, been given the honorary titles of people of color, like for example, Arabs. And, um, and this, is, this is the milieu. And if you want to understand it, actually the, one of the more, more interesting comments was made not by uh, the Crimson editorial, but uh, by Amnesty International's uh, personnel a few months ago as they were defending their report, so-called, called labeling Israel an apartheid state. Um, uh, there is a, 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 one of the lead authors of the report, Luther, was interviewed in, uh, in Times of Israel and was asked about the timing of this, what led to it? And he said, well, people are talking about it. And the question is, who's talking about this? Who is it that's, mu that's mumbling, oh, Israel's an apartheid state? And it's not the governments of the world, right? Uh, you can see that government after government has been dismissing the report as, as preposterous, right? And it, it's, it's clearly not the Jewish community. Uh, one of the things that the head of the International in the United States had to do was explain why we have to not pay attention to the opinion of Jews because what they really want to think is what Amnesty International is telling them to think. Um, no, where, it, where it's being discussed is this crowd, uh, it's the progressive crowd, the woke crowd, the diversity crowd. Among them, they're, they're in a competition to constantly top themselves. There was an interesting um, uh, uh, study published by Heritage Foundation uh, a couple of months ago in which they uh, examined the Twitter accounts of diversity officers in, a, in US uh, colleges. And what they found was that overwhelmingly, 96% um, have an obsessive negative focus on Israel. Um, so for example, one of the examples they, they, they said that they, they tweet 
much, much more about uh, uh, Israel than they do about China. And 96% of their tweets about Israel are negative, whereas 60 something percent of their tweets about China are positive. It's not about human rights. It's not about their record. It's not about geopolitical importance. It's about signaling to the rest of this crowd. If you want to be a proper, woke, progressive diversity person, then you have to be anti-Jew. And that's really what's happening here. And the, the, the competition is such that you know, last year you didn't have to say apartheid, but now Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have said it. And so you have to top that. And now that, that the Harvard Crimson has come out for BDS, not only is everybody going to have to top that, but they're going to have to come up with new and harsher forms of Jew hatred to show that they're, sta they're running in front of the diversity crowd to hate Jews. You know, before, that, but, but wait, let me just, actually, you go on. I want to just take it into the kind of the, the core um, premises of the woke revolution. What is the way that they view the world and the centrality of, of hating Jews and of seeking the annihilation of Israel in the woke uh, sort of governing philosophy, their way of looking at the world and how it operates. But um, before we move to that, um, just you, what did you want to play off of what Avi just said? I just wanted to uh, make one distinction, a nuance. And, and I think one of the things that, that Avi said is so important is that if you're Jewish in America, you're white privilege and therefore you're by definition I, I, guilty. I, I did not say that. The Jews are, are defined either as white or non-white, depending on who you want to hate. So there is no white supremacist who thinks that being white is good that would define a Jew as being white. It's only those who define Jews as being bad, sorry, whites as being bad, who will define Jews as whites. That, I, that, it's that, not that was my point. Being a, a, yeah, okay. No, no, that was my point. My, my point, that's exactly my point, it, it, is it from the left, being, being Jewish is being white. Being white is being guilty. That is, that is the governing uh, critical race theory uh, a, a concept of uh, of wokeism, it, but uh, but having said that, let's bear in mind there are a lot of Jews who are part of the progressive radical woke movement. the The editor in chief of the Harvard Crimson is a Jew. Uh, she's a, she uh, her name is uh, Orly Rappaport, and uh, she very proudly wrote in her on her Twitter account just the other day, "I'm so proud to be part of this thoughtful group." Quote unquote. Uh, regarding their um, their full uh, endorsement of uh, of PSC and uh, and BDS, and the point that uh, an additional point I think we have to make is this whole point about apartheid. Um, when you when you Nazify Israel by using the word apartheid because you can't outwardly use the word Nazi, even though they've described Israel as you know genocidal, racist, bigoted, uh, uh, war criminal, um, you you're essentially trying to um, politicize anti-Semitism th because the, the, the Harvard Crimson editorial said specifically in its second line, we of course oppose all forms of anti-Semitism. So we have, to, we have to say, well, if the editor-in-chief of the Crimson is a Jew and many people, including Peter Beinhardt, Peter Beinhardt one, of the, one of the worst um, you know, adversaries of the Jewish people today in the, in the Jewish collective today, are, are leading the, the so-called woke revolution, what is it really, where are we really holding in terms of understanding, as Carolyn just asked, you know, the overall world worldview. The overall worldview is oppressor versus oppressed. The, the, the worldview is that which Arafat expressed back in 1974 and then caused the 1975 UN uh, General Assembly to pass uh, 3379 with Zionism as racism. There's, there's this notion that you're either a white oppressor or you're part of the, uh, of the colored black um, oppressed, and then and and that's where we are with, with with regard to Israel, which is so dangerous because all it, all this BDS PSC Students for Justice in Palestine is basically a pretext of incitement to mass murder uh, once again. But it's being viewed, unfortunately, by many in the United States as totally legitimate political critique of uh, of a nation state and the international community. And that, before we get and, to that, let me just I, I want to actually I, I think you're right about the oppressor versus the oppressed, but you know, I, I, I've spoken about this in the past with, uh, with our colleague and friend, David Wormser. And I also saw a really interesting uh, um, episode of Uncommon Knowledge with Peter Robinson, speaking with Jordan Peterson um, 
I was watching it last night and um, and Peterson was was asked about the woke revolution and and what it was and and he basically came to the same conclusion that that Dave Wormser talked about, which is that it it is a rejection of the Judeo Christian foundations of the West that there are you know that there's a spiritual underpinning that we're under God that you can't really understand freedom without understanding that we have unalienable uh, God given rights etc and that. If you want to undermine that and embrace instead a Marxist understanding of of the human condition and of and of the world, then you replace it with a Marxist idea of oppressor versus oppressed. That the history of humanity and and also um, all societies, including a proper society, utopian Marxist society, is based upon power relations. And that until now, it's been oppressor oppressing the oppressed. And the idea of a Marxist revolution is that the power, power equation will be overturned and that the oppressed will oppress the oppressors. And, and so in this, if you're rejecting a Judeo-Christian foundation of Western civilization and um, you want to replace it with a Marxist uh, concept, then you have to destroy the Jews. And you have to go after the Jews because, you know, you can go after the Christians, but so long as you have this underpinning of the Bible and of the biblical people and of national self-determination uh, with, with the Jewish state, then you're always going to have this prototype that you're going to have to rail against. And so here, it's sort of like the collectivization of the Goldstein in, in, in 1984, that Israel is Goldstein and that it has to be destroyed in order to advance a totalitarian revolution. So that, I mean, I think that the basic argument just to make it uh, very, very precise is that anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, uh, the demonization, the Nazification of the Jewish state uh, is, a cent is central, which is why you see this obsessive compulsion to attack Israel by all of these diversity officers on college campuses. So if, because, you know, and this goes to the question of what you were saying, Dan, of, you know, how do you discuss BDS? How do you view BDS? How do Jews view, view uh, Israel and anti-Israel activism and what it means for them? And um, basically it's saying that Jew hatred, the hatred of the Jewish collective is not just, you know, a regrettable aspect that you can fight on its own basis, but that it's actually part of the core of the woke revolution. Um, uh, 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 how, first, uh, let's turn to Avi and then go back to Dan. I just want to talk about this a little bit because it's important as I see it, because if, if anti-Semitism is core to the woke revolution, then you can't fight you can't you can't fight it uh only by fighting bds you'll never get at it because it's it's a uh, it's a core of a much larger whole um how do you view that uh avi so um uh, two observations first um so number one is there's a little bit of tension between the idea that um um the reason they're going after Jews is because they're going after Judeo-Christian civilization, and they're going after Jews because Jews are playing the role of the, the fictional Goldstein in the 1984 novel. Um, because the, one of them says they're, they're going after Jews because um, Jews are a real target. They, Jews represent something uh, important that they want to destroy. And the other one says they're going after Jews just because they need a scapegoat. They need somebody to hate, and Jews are the figure uh, to hate. Now, I, I think it's a lot more the latter than the former. I, I, I think that that's this is Jews have played that role in Marxism since Marx, right? Of uh, the people. Why to hate. are they mutually mm -hmm. exclusive, though, in your view? Because um, there is nothing that we can do. If I'm correct, if we're simply the scapegoat, there is is no way out of the Jew hatred. There is a, a group, this brings me actually to the second point. You know, there's, there's in, in uh, Malcolm X wrote about uh, these parlors in Harlem there where they would offer the services of bleaching black skin so they would look more white. 
right? Um, and he describes all the different ways that he looks at this. You know, it's pathetic, it's horrifying. One of the things about it is it's not, I mean, when you look at somebody like, like Peter Beinart, who's uh, trying to bleach his skin, um, I don't think that you should hate Beinart for, you should, you should pity him. He, he's a symptom of anti-Semitism rather than a creator of it. Right. Um, now, if that's the case, when you see, you know, a Harvard Crimson Jewish editor going and extolling why it's so brave for her paper to be anti-Semitic and why she's happy to be a part of it, um, it's because she's convinced that if if she declaims the right things, if she declaims her hatred of of Goldstein, <laughs> then she'll be spared. And it's true that BDS is, is um, a movement for not for universal economic discrimination against Jews, only economic discrimination against the overwhelming majority of Jews. And so it's possible to labor with this delusion that you're going to be among the Jews that are spared from discrimination. But I don't think that that's really going to last. And it's not going to last because ultimately it had, doesn't have anything to do with anything that Jews believe or stand for or act on behalf of. It's about being Jews. Right? I think that that's true for white people too. I mean, I think, you know, there's, a, a, there's, this, there's this concept, right, that, that you have deplorable white people and then, then you have people who are white, who are allies of the oppressed. And at the end of the day, this is not a sustainable model, right? I mean, I don't think. I think but there's that no such, I mean, the woke, there's no the woke such thing. let me just finish the, the woke yeah. CEOs who are pushing this, you know, uh, this woke revolution inside of their corporate boardrooms or the university presidents who are white, who are embracing and trying to ride this tiger of the woke revolution in their university campuses or wherever it is, or, or Hollywood executives, at the end of the day, they're they're going to be eaten as well. I mean, it's not just the Jews who are trying to ride this a BDS thing that, you know, are going to be able to slip slide into positions of, you know, as a Jew Jews who get to attack their fellow Jews. But the as a white, white people are also going to have the same problem. And, you know, that's why I'm not sure that that you're right, that the two that being Goldstein and being a core part of the woke uh, uh, ideology uh, are mutually exclusive. I, I, there's I, I, there's no such thing as a white. I mean, there's no commonality of the experience of Italians and Mexicans and Russians and uh, Scots in the United States. I, I, I mean, it, white white is a category that makes sense only in a certain uh, context, right? So of course, there it's only as a as a, a figure of hatred, right? There's no white was a was a category of of legal entitlement at one point, and then um, after the, the the end of Jim Crow, it ceased to be, and now it's just a political term for for striking either in favor of a certain kind of bigotry, if you're a white supremacist, or in favor of a certain kind of political hatred, if you're against so-called white privilege. But there's no content to it otherwise, right? Now, if you want to, yeah. It, 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 what's going on with Jews is the same thing. It just being Jewish has content. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a Jewish people. There are Jewish customs. There are Jewish beliefs. There's a Jewish religion. Um, but you're right, and that's that's my point. Is it those have nothing to do with um, our place in uh, progressive anti-Semitism. It has nothing to do with anything we believe or do. Or our, this, you know, our history or our heritage. It has to do just with uh, we are picked out as a figure of hatred. Now that also means like, what can we do about this? Where ultimately, it's you know, there's we can't convince anybody within that movement to leave. We can fight them. We can embarrass them. We can make it painful to be in that movement. We can try to pressure people who are outside that movement. Um, to reject it and them and make it tougher for them. I mean, one of the problems we have is that um, even though the progressive uh, anti-Semites are still a minority in the Democratic Party, they have they have the run of the land. And it's because people who are indifferent to this 
are boosting them. You know, Pelosi is not one of them, but she's boosting them. Biden is not one of them, but he's boosting them, right? Um, and you, we can't make any headway by trying to convince people like Ilan Omar. We can make a lot of headway by making it very uncomfortable for people like Biden to boost the anti-Semites. They're the people giving a leg up to them. We have to make it more difficult for them to do that. I think, what, uh, folks, I think we have to put Israel as the collective uh, Jewish target back in the middle of this discussion. Because if we look in uh, 2019, 2021, and then the first six months or first four months of 22, the unprecedented rise year to year, uh, beginning in 19 from previous years and, and since 19, in subsequent years of anti-Semitism is all related to a, uh, a to a demonization, dehumanization, delegitimization of the Jewish of, of sovereign Jews, and that is used as a uh, an excuse, as a pretext to attack Jews. Um, with the argument that that Avi, you and Carolyn are making, is very true. But I do think we need to understand that Israel is being used as the pretext and the context for the dehumanization and demonization of individual Jews in the, in the United States and around the world. Is if, if we don't understand that, and if we don't understand that the, Palestine, that the Palestine Liberation Organization, the Hamas, um, and, and, and previous to that, the Soviet Union has used this argument for decades, um, then we're giving a pass to um, you know, the, ideological, the ideological creators of this Jew hatred is a combination of the Chinese Communist Party, the Soviets, and, Isl and, and the Islamists. We see, we, see the, we see the language in Haj Amin al-Husseini. We see the language in, in the establishment of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928 and its militarization in the 1940s and 50s by Said Qutub. We see it in the Arabic translation of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, um, which was very broadly um, uh, distributed by the Muslim Brotherhood. We see it in, in, you know, in Soviet uh, Richard, Richard Kemp wrote a fantastic uh, a brief on this recently, about two months ago. Um, we see this in basic Soviet literature, um, that the Jews are Nazis and that, um, and, and that the Jews are evil. And, and this is exactly the type of political nomenclature we see today. And if we don't, I think we have to go in a, uh, there has to be prescriptively a full court press on the, on the Palestinian leadership who are, um, um, from which this is metastasizing. It's metastasizing in all of the Palestinian um, institutions that are being funded by the West. It's, 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 being, uh, it's being advocated by the hundreds of Palestinian expat professors at the University of San Diego, the University at, uh, at, um, uh, Univer at UCLA, at Berkeley, at Columbia, across the United States. And, and, that is, and this is one of the reasons that uh, Jew hatred is metastasizing under under this mask of, of, uh, of political critique of Israel and pushed very much by Palestinian professors in the United States. We have to, I think we really have to put the, Israel as the collective Jew back on the map in this, in this whole calculation. You know, I mean, that actually goes to a couple of things. One is, I think, first of all, I think it's important just to point out, and I think it, it should be widely understood, but just to make sure that everybody is on the same page uh, that we're on when we say this, when when you use when you put Israel as the collective Jew and you use Israel as it's it's an instrumental use of the Jewish state in order to demonize Jews wherever they are in New York in Paris and in, in in anywhere in Russia wherever it happens to be and uh, what that means though for Jews is that we don't. Nothing, nothing that Jews do in the Jewish state or outside the Jewish state are, it can impact this. It's not, we're not hated because of anything that Israel does. It's that they're, they're using Israel, the, the concept of Israel, of a Nazi Jewish state, of the, this demonization of the Jewish collective as a Nazi state, as an apartheid state, as something that's evil inherently by its very nature and can never can never expiate its sin, that this is that this is being used. And so it's an imaginary Israel. And as a result, this attempt by Jews, if you want to look at it in, in sort of an innocent way, which I don't, but if you wanted to understand or place people like Orly Rappaport or Peter Beinart into a 
into a cognitive concept, con, 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 context uh, that would in, in some way explain what they're doing, that they're trying to get out from under this Jewish guilt, they've accepted this idea that there's something they've they've internalized this, or they or to to the contrary, they think that well maybe Israel is doing things that are wrong, and if we point them out in a very harsh manner, that we are going to be able to expiate the 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 uh, collective guilt that they're placing on the Jews. In other words, it's not about the Jews; it's about the Jew haters. They're the ones doing the demonization, and there's nothing that Jews can do as individuals or as a collective to get them off our back. It's not about proving that our sincerity uh, in in wanting peace and our peaceful intentions towards the Arabs or the the moral way in which we wage war or anything like that. It's there's nothing that Israel can do. I mean, that that's your essential point. And then that really brings us to, first of all, in the United States, and even in, you know, other Western countries, the CRIF in France and uh, and the uh, Zionist Council in, in Britain and in other places in Australia and, and Canada, and, and how are they responding to this? And are they understanding what's at stake? And do they care? Is there too much Jewish support for the, or too much Jewish identification with the woke revolution uh, to enable Jewish institutions to actually act firmly in defense of, of Jewish rights, whether in Israel or, or in any of the separate states of the diaspora? Um, uh, who wants to open this one? Go ahead, Avi. No, 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 Dan. <laughs> Dan. Uh, um, I, I, one one important point here to 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 launch uh, this important theme that Carolyn has raised now is that that Jews in the diaspora have been placed in, in a uh, um, in, you know to quote Camus no exit in 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 a, a completely impossible situation which is that which is really um, a function of the strategy of of uh, of the PLO and the Soviets which is that if you want to be woke if you want to be morally acceptable to um, this new remade uh, Western society. You can either divorce yourself from the source of collective evil in the world, which is only in their view, the state of Israel, or you can um, either passively or actively attach yourself to the only source of collective evil in the world, which is the, which are sovereign Jews, which is the, the Jewish state. So, so this, this strategy is exactly what generates a, an Orly Rappaport led Crimson editorial and this new um, legitimized mainstreamed anti-Semitism on campus uh, is, that, uh, is, is that you can, you have a choice. You as a Jew have a choice. Divorce yourself from the source of collective evil or try to divorce uh, and, and be okay, be woke and remake the world in a new John Lennon imagined reality or you are marked. Um, you are marked for social and political death, uh, and and physical violence. So th this is the this is the uh, catch twenty two situation that 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 Jews are in, um, uh, and and there really is nothing that Jews can do. Is a point that Avi has been making over the last forty minutes. There's really nothing that 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 uh, that Jews can do to to, to get out of that. The, I think the answer really is to attack the source of to attack the source of evil all the time, which I think Israel has done a um, a very poor job in doing. I mean, Israel, the collective Jewish community is the base is the frontline target here. The secondary target are Jews in the diaspora, and Jew, and Israel as the frontline target has not done has done a horrible job um, uh, for fear of losing its uh, its uh, a supposed peace partner. The Palestinian Authority (PLO), whose narrative it adopted, hook, line, and sinker, 25 years ago. So this leads us into the second and final point, and I'm going to hand it off to Avi, which is, it. Natan Sharansky has said on numerous occasions, it's very difficult for people on the center, from the center to the right, to criticize the right. It's very difficult for people on the left, um, center left, to criticize itself and further left. And this is, and this is sort of the. Um, this is sort of the headlock that the Jewish world has put itself in, is the right doesn't know how to criticize the right, the left doesn't know how to criticize the left. Um, uh, when I say criticize, I mean to say uh, on the right, go after the source of evil, which is the Palestinian leadership and, the, and its entire Weltanschauung, its entire 
of Weltanschauung, which is collective Jew hatred and individual Jew hatred, by the way. And Israel has Israel has got to take the lead in in outing and 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 attacking um, the source of evil in the in in this ideological war. It's an ideological war led by Palestinian leadership. And and unless we do that, um, we're just going to keep uh, treading water and drowning. Um, okay, uh, th two things. F first, let's just this is this is more minor, but it's it's important when. Um, when someone like a Mahmoud Abbas goes before um, a gathering of European leaders and starts spinning these fantasies about Jews poisoning the wells and killing Palestinians that way, and he gets a, 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 a raucous, yeah, a raucous right. applause from these European leaders, who's who's the problem there? Is it Abbas, who's a Holocaust denier to begin with, who? who we've all known all along as an anti-Semite? Or is it the European leaders who are in embracing this anti-Semitism, who are saying that that's, no, that's fine, that's good, because we've appointed you to be the innocent victim of the evil, cruel Jews. And I think that the, the problem is, is the broader European leaders um, rather than Abbas himself. It, it, Anti-Semitism is a central theme of, of Palestinian politics in, in just about everything. Um, but it's, it's, it's not as if we, if, if we started attacking the Palestinians for that, the way they deserve to be, criticize them, I don't think that would change very much in the West because the real problem is um, Palestinian supporters of the Palestinians in the West don't care about that because they're perfectly fine with that kind of anti-Semitism. They just embrace themselves for the, they, they, they embrace the anti-Semites as the innocent victims of the Jews. They, they pat themselves on their back for uh, their courage in being willing to, to face the criticism of Jews who call everybody anti-Semites. Um, and they double down on their actions against Jews. So I, I don't think that there's, there's the answer is to focus on the Palestinians simply because the anti-Semites in the West don't care. Okay, then you get to the second part. Like, what is the role of, of, of uh, diaspora Jews in this? And I, I think actually, let's take a non-Israel example for a moment. Okay, there's, a, there's this wave of legislation going across Europe right now to ban uh, kosher slaughter of, of, of meat. Right. And that's clearly anti-Semitic. Now, it's, it's not only anti-Semitic. There, there are two motives. Right. Um, um, one of the, one of the motives is is uh, um, to discourage Muslim immigration to those countries. And the second motive or maybe the dominant motive is is it's anti-Jewish. Right. Now, the thing is, most Jews don't actually uh, care about kosher laws. Most Jews don't uh, uh, observe kosher laws. Right? But no, nobody uh, among them, those who don't observe it, they have no difficulty understanding that it's anti-Semitic le legislation. When you're trying to ban uh, uh, circumcision of boys, or you're trying to ban uh, Saturday Sabbath observance, or you're trying to ban kosher slaughter, Right. Um, it's true that a lot of Jews don't follow these these customs, but the one thing that unites all of them, is they're all done by Jews and they may be done by other people, but not by the same people. Right. The Saturday Sabbath, Sabbath observance is not done by the same people who do uh, um, uh, uh, male circumcision. Um, and you, when you have this wave of legislation, nobody has a problem understanding that's what it is. All of a sudden, when it comes to Israel and you have uh, these uh, a mass of 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 actions, <clears throat> to boycott Jews, allegedly because of crimes of the Jewish state, then all of a sudden in the, in the Jewish community, you, people are flummoxed, right? Um, you don't have um, the equivalent of J Street on kosher slaughter, uh, uh, an organization of Jews um, or primarily Jews that lobbies in favor of, of banning kosher slaughter allegedly to protect animal welfare. Right? You don't have the equivalent of, of J Street uh, on, on male circumcision, where you have this mass organization lobbying to ban uh, uh, circumcision of boys, allegedly on the grounds of, of child welfare. On the why other hand, that? when it comes- But why is that? Why is there no J Street of kosher slaughter and circumcision? And, it's because and of the way the rest of the diaspora Jewish community reacts to them. Instead of calling them out for what they are, 
they're flummoxed. Right? Instead of instead of saying that J Street is simply a very thin cover for uh, a group of anti-Semites, J Street lobbies for the Iranian genocide against Israel, against Jews. Right? J Street lobbies for Palestinian terrorists who kill Jews. Right? You have groups that are flunks. They don't know what to do with them. They, they don't want to get the policy arguments. But but here's a question. I, I don't know. Maybe you were planning on answering it anyway. But let me let me just uh, let me just ask it anyway. I mean, you know, the best friend that the Jews of the United States had against this wave of this tsunami of Jew hatred from the left that's organized around the demonization of the Jewish state was President Trump. I mean, he passed. He signed the executive order making BDS, you know, protecting Jewish students on campus from, from BDS activism uh, and, and recognizing that this is a form of Jew hatred and persecution of Jews on college campuses. And he got very little to no support from uh, the organized Jewish leadership, even if they said that this was a good thing, they all have you know, denigrated him and alleged that he's an anti-Semite and, and campaigned very, very hard for Biden and for Clinton, uh, you know, in, in, in 2016. And so, you know, you have that. And then the question becomes, or it's not really a question, I guess it's more like a, a, a list of, you know, what is, what is more, what is more central or does it really matter? Is it that, is it a conviction? Is it a desire? That you know to want to be part of these leftist institutions that are propagating this anti-Jewish campaign. I mean, I just saw a couple of days ago that Princeton, for instance, you know, they used to. My my brother went to Princeton, and it used to be around twenty percent Jewish. It was always one of the they had one of the lower levels of Jewish enrollment than the other uh, Ivy Leagues, but they had a significant Jewish community, and now only two percent of of uh, of the uh, undergraduate. Uh, uh, population at, at Princeton is uh, is Jewish, so that you know it's it, it, Jews are disappearing from campuses. Campuses are becoming much less Jewish, much more much more anti anti Jewish, much more Arab, much more um, much more woke, obviously. But that there's this desire still among Jews to be part of. They still value most uh, Ivy League institutions and elite uh, elite credentials, and therefore they don't want to go against it. Or is it part of this identification and lack of awareness of, of either lack of awareness or awareness and agreement with the uh, with the hatred of Jews because they are woke themselves and their woke identity has replaced a Jewish identity for so many American Jews? I mean, is it that they identify with this, or is it that they want the credentials and it's uh, they prefer, as Dan said, not to be not to be socially, you know, become social pariahs. Is it out of convenience or out of conviction that the Jews are not, are, are not seeing that are joining J Street, are giving them lots of money and, <clears throat> and, they're, and they're refusing to see the anti-Semitic nature of this, of this organization that I, exists to advance it? I think the, conveni the, the, the conviction follows from the convenience. That is, um, it's much better to have bleached skin in this world. So they're convincing themselves that bleaching their skin is the right thing and is the moral imperative of the day. Um, but I, I, don't think, I don't think we're going to make a lot of headway um, going after individual Jews who are too weak of character um, to exercise their conscience. I think that um, we have to... Um, focus our criticism and our efforts on leaders in the Jewish community who are simply failing to, to act or worse um, are joining up with the anti-Semites. And so you have uh, um, Israel studies and Jewish studies programs uh, on campuses around the United States where they are for the most part purveyors of this kind of anti-Semitism more than anything else. And um, can you give um, an example? Can, can you give an example of that playing out? Um, uh, Myers at uh, UCLA, right? Um, um, Ian Lustig, who's now stepping down at Penn, right? Um, 
you, know, you, you go through figure after figure, they're, they're, they're at the center of, of anti-Semitic activity on campus, on uh, propagating anti-Semitic propaganda as, as scholarship. Right. Um, and, this is around um, the concept of Israel, though, Avi. Mention it. In other words, Lustig, these guys take Israel as the collective I, Jewish I think, anchor, I, and, they, and, and anti-Semitism comes out of that. That's right. I think that's right. But I also think it's it's really not relevant. That is, um, um, in the following sense. Okay, so but when when people are doing their anti-Semitism as part of eugenics, I don't think we win the argument by talking about the better way to understand eugenics, right? When 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 they're when they're phrasing their hatred of Jews as a collective by talking about the Jewish state r rather than the Jewish religion or about a Jewish custom, I don't think we make a lot of headway by confining ourselves to the box that they're in. I think that what we have to uh, see the bigger picture is um, there's a straight line continuity between these different kinds of anti-Semitism, where they're, they're expressed in the, in the, in the language of, of Christ killing or eugenics or the evil of the Jewish state. Um, they borrow from one another their themes, right? So the Crimson uh, editorial we were talking about uh, borrows all the themes of pernicious Jewish power and uh, Jews killing children, right? Uh, um, and all of the things that you see in all the different kinds of anti-Semitism, they borrow liberally from one another. And we shouldn't pretend that they're separate when they're not. But at any rate, this, this, you know, the main point is not, I, I don't think the main point is to engage in their language. The main point is to try to uh, get at them, right? Now, um, the reason that all these people hold their positions is because primarily Jewish donors over the years have, have thrown money at them in order to hire these people. The reason that uh, um, um, prominent Democrats have, have backed um, the progressive anti-Semites is because Jewish donors have continued to throw money at them, right? Um, the reason that uh, Trump was punished for um, philo-Semitic, for pro-Jewish policies was because Jewish donors were throwing money at people who were going after Trump on that ground, on those grounds. And so um, I think that, you know, where we have to go at, it, this is not a question of trying to convince Ian Lustig. Ian Lustig is a lost cause if there ever was one, you know, as much as Peter Beinart or any one of the other people who bleach their skin. I think that the, the, the real issue is to go after people who, whose convenience and, as married to their conviction, where they've decided that, that they want to feel their, their weight in the Democratic Party by, by backing the enemies of the Jewish people. And we have, to, we have to get at them. We have to force them to confront the anti-Semites. And the same thing for the large Jewish organizations, that have uh, have meekly cowed to the um, uh, uh, people from you know Hyas and J Street and the rest of the organizations that engage in anti-Semitism, and um, um, for fear of breaking unity, have have brought the anti-Semites into these institutions. We have to push them out. We have to that is we have to push the the people who still care the people who are still engaged um, to take a stand because um, uh, if, if we don't do it now, it's not going to, uh, uh, well, all that's going to happen is these institutions will be totally lost to us. Maybe they are. Well, I mean, that's the question that I want to pose to you, Dan, because you know, you're, you have your finger on the pulse of a lot of these different organizations and you work with them. Um, you know, there's a growing sense uh, in Israel, particularly uh, on, you know, in the Israeli right, uh, uh, which is that, uh, ugh, forget it, you know, there's no point that these American Jews are lost, they're not going to fight, um, you know, trying to win over the hearts and minds of the American Jewish community, of the American Jewish leadership, that they're going to do anything for Israel, that they're going to be allies in the fight against uh, Jew hatred in its current form, and its in contemporary Jew hatred, which is centered around Israel, that, you know, we just have to we just have to 
forget about it because they're not doing anything just like they did so little and too little too late uh, to fight uh, the annihilation of European Jewry. American Jews are again exposing themselves as weak, much more interested in being accepted by the elites in the United States than protecting themselves and their civil rights as Jews in the United States. And, you know, let's just Let's just throw in the towel, you know, let, let's focus on the things that we can actually achieve. And Israeli Jews cannot achieve any significant headway with an American Jewish uh, institutional world where you, you, are, you see those institutions corrupted from the inside by people who are weak and who just want to be embraced by uh, increasingly anti-Semitic Democrats and get, you know, get prestige uh, at uh, increasingly anti-Semitic uh, elite institutions like Harvard. I mean, what, what do you answer that? And how do you see the Jewish institutional response adapting as anti-Semitic, uh, uh, anti-Semitism and elite institution that the Jews have always sought at, at the embrace of becomes more and more uh, toxic? Carolyn, the, the data tells us that there's room for optimism. The data on American Jewish life and its affiliation and identification with the state of Israel is still in the area of 60%. So- Among Americans you know, or among American yeah, Jews? Among American Jews. American Jews, um, uh, and now this is it, you know, I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a, demogra a demographic cut within the, clearly the 20 to 40 sector is much more challenged than the than the forty to eighty sector. Uh, you know, uh, we're um, talking about age other, groups. The age, age groups. groups, yeah, yeah, age sector, yeah, um, uh, age category. But overall, well over sixty percent of American Jewry still identifies with Israel, as, and and they identify as Zionists with Israel. So all is not lost. The the, the point we really have to you know as we end our dis sort of our discussion, but a discussion that is only beginning and continuing is where did this anti-Semitism crawl? It didn't just happen. This is not the big bang. It is not, as they say in Hebrew, yesh me It didn't, it didn't happen between 1967 and 1993 when Israel conquered uh, Judea, Samaria, Gaza, uh, uh, and uh, the Golan Heights. It happened when the collective Jewish community, which is the anchor and the focus uh, uh, and the center of American Jewish identity in the post-war period decided to collapse and sold out its uh, it, it, it sold out its uh, its rights and its in its entire raison d'etre to its arch enemy. That is that is in my, in my view and in the view of of others um, one of the central uh, 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 reasons that we have today this virulent um, strain of new anti-Semitism and, and as well as classic anti-Semitism. The Jewish institutional world in the United States um, looks to Israel for an, as an example. It looks to Israel as, as to say, where are we, where are we today? That without a strong, much more united Israel position against its enemies, um, it will it will continue to enable or allow the United States Jewish community, which is already weak, frightened, convenience driven, um, uh, you know, socially pressured, and assimilating at an unprecedented rate in the post World War II era, to continue to slide down that slippery slope that we talked about an hour ago when we opened this discussion about the Harvard Crimson eliminationists. Um, a, a proud eliminationist uh, screed against the Jewish people and the nation state of the, and, and its nation state. So in, in, in summary, I would say that the, the leadership of the Jewish world has to take a principled stand um, uh, for, it, uh, for the collective Jewish world against anti-Semitism, as Avi has said, which can be thread from all different, uh, all different versions and all different flavors and all different types. But at the end of the day, Sharansky has said this, and, I, and again, I bring up Sharansky's name because he's really brilliant on this issue. The focal point, the center of gravity of Jewish international identity in this post-war era is still the Jewish collective in Israel. And therefore, I think that because 
that, that we in Israel are very much um, a large part, if not the main part of the answer to the challenges of anti-Semitism at Harvard, at Columbia, uh, at the University of San Diego, in Europe that we are, are facing. And until Israel takes a principled position and, and blast the European Union every time it comes out with an anti-Semitic uh, expression, as Avi talked about the standing ovation that Mahmoud Abbas got in 2018 from the European Commission, there was, there was no major Israeli outrage at that particular, at that particular super anti-Semitic on steroids expression um, uh, by the, the European Union. And until Israel, and, and neither was there, by the way, at, at the um, Durban One conference, uh, which was the heart and soul, the genesis of the anti-Semitic uh, apartheid movement we see today. And until Israel takes a united position, a morally centric united position, I think it, things will only get worse in the international diaspora who looks to Israel as a moral example of how they should behave as Jews and not to be sucked in to this um, uh, Palestinian driven, progressive driven, radical driven, Mark Lamont Hill driven, wokeism, Black Lives Matter, complete racial social remaking of the American, uh, of the American Jewish community. All right, um, Avi, I, I want you to, you, your last remark and then I'll just close about where this is taking us, um, the expansion, the mainstreaming, the, the escalation of the, of the anti-Semitic campaign by woke revolutionaries, where does this, what does this mean for American-Israel relations? Leaving aside the Jewish community, we see more and more graduates of these elite institutions, whether it's Meyer Bitar or now the new press secretary, uh, um, what's her name, uh, Corinne uh, Jean Pierre. Um, these are these are spokespeople. These are supporters, advocates for uh, uh, BDS, for for uh, viewing Israel as a pariah state, and they're now taking uh, key positions in in the Biden administration. They and um, so where do you see this uh, impacting in the long term, the future of Israel-US relations? Um, well, let's, let's uh, understand there's a very different phenomenon than what Dan was just talking about. Because I, I think that Dan is absolutely right that the um, Israeli leadership has failed to call out uh, pervasive anti-Semitism in European rhetoric and actions. It's failed to call out uh, uh, pervasive anti-Semitism in uh, uh, Palestinian rhetoric and actions and in, in so many other places in the world and it's done so only for uh, political reasons of late. So you, you look at the, you know, the way that, uh, um, uh, just take you know, the, this current government, the way it responded to uh, anti-Semitic comments uh, first by the Ukrainian president uh, addressing the Knesset, where he engaged in, in really some horrible Holocaust denial in which he was claiming that the, the, the Ukrainians uh, rescued Jews, ignoring the, the uh, nearly 100,000 Ukrainians that, that volunteered for the SS in order to murder Jews. Right, um, um, and then the the, the anti-Semitic comments of uh, Russia's foreign minister, in which he fabricated some uh, uh, a Jewish descent for Hitler, and the government blew up about the the Russian anti-Semitism and and kept completely silent about the Ukrainian anti-Semitism um, because of you know some ridiculous sense that uh, right now. The Biden administration wants to hear criticism of Russia, but not criticism of the Ukraine, and therefore we can't call out Ukrainian anti-Semitism. Why? I think we should be calling out everybody's anti-Semitism, and the Jewish institutions in the United States have to be calling out anti-Semitism there as well. And whether how it makes no difference how many uh, uh, Jews in, in the United States are consciously uh, Zionist any more than how many consciously observe the Sabbath. Um, uh, attacking the Jewish collective as such is anti-Semitism, and Jewish institutions have to uh, speak about that. That said, we don't control, neither Jewish institutions nor Israel control what's happening in the Democratic Party. Right, um, right now in the Democratic Party, there is a minority, uh, a Marxist progressive woke minority that's driving the agenda. 
And that agenda is among other things, anti-Semitic. And that anti-Semitism is not passive and it's not purely domestic. A lot of that anti-Semitism is directed at um, organizing hatred and discrimination against the Jewish state. Um, now, what can we do about it? Um, the answer, unfortunately, is, is, is little. There are some things we can do that is, you know, uh, Jewish donors to the Democratic Party can um, start paying attention and um, cut off funds to anybody who doesn't take active steps to drive the progressives out of their positions of power in the party. Um, and there, there are Jewish donors in the United States who have reasonably significant roles who can uh, exercise some influence. There are uh, some subjects where Israel can stand up to American pressure and say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to endorse this theory that, that um, um, non-Jews have property rights, Jews don't have property rights. Non-Jews have worship rights, Jews do not have worship rights. We, we can't endorse these kinds of anti-Semitic theories. We're not going to, right? But that said, ultimately, this is a fight. What's going on in the, the Democratic Party in the United States is what happened in the Labor Party in the UK. It's, it's their fight, it's not ours. We're going to be the victims if the bad guys win. Um, but we don't control that, right? Um, we just have to be aware of the risk. Right. I, I think I think one of the things that you know, if if I may give my takeaway on this, I mean, I I think that you know one of the things that we have to really see is that you know for a long time, and people like Alan Dershowitz as well, you know, they would say on the left, liberal Jews, uh, more than progressive Jews, but liberal Jews who uh, would say. I'm pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian or pro-Palestine. I believe in a two-state solution. I, I think that this is the way to go um, and there's no contradiction between the two. Um, and then people like myself on the right uh, have been saying, actually, that's not true because the Palestinian national movement, such as it is, is, uh, is a genocidal movement against the Jews and that it will it cannot, as it is proven over and over again, it is unappeasable. It has been offered, you know, all of the things that it's supposed to want numerous times since uh, 1933 with the with the Peel Commission, um, and it has never accepted <clears throat> these things. It has never accepted. Uh, it has never accepted partition of the land of Israel east of the uh, east of the Jordan River. Um, I mean, west of the Jordan River, and and it won't. And so this concept that you can be both. Uh, it sounded nice for an awfully long time, and many people believed it. But I think that what we're seeing now is that the slippery slope uh, we've re it has reached its destination. And when you and when you see on the ground that everybody in positions of leadership in the Palestinian Arab uh, world are all saying the exact same thing, that you know, Jews have filthy feet, whether they're the prime minister of Jordan or the head of Hamas, and that they're infecting the Temple Mount, Al-Aqsa. Um, and when you're seeing people calling for the butchery of Jews and then Jews being butchered as a consequence, whether it's the head of Hamas or, or, or leaders in Fatah that are supported by Mahmoud Abbas, um, then we have to understand that the concept that you can be both, that you can sit on the fence, that you can be everybody's friend is now defunct. And it's time to stand up and decide who you're with. And the Harvard Crimson and some and Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, all of these uh, liberal elite or progressive elite institutions and organizations have put their cards on the table and said, we're with the people hacking Jews with axes. That's who we stand with. And you know, it's about time that all of these other people recognize that this is an this is an either or proposition, and it's very difficult, you know, as a practical matter to make uh, make a clear statement. But in the absence of a clear statement, you end up supporting and legitimizing people who say that Israel is a Nazi state that doesn't have an, a right to exist and by rights ought to be annihilated, whether by an Iranian nuclear bomb or by Palestinians wielding axes or suicide bombers 
or what have you. And I think that we, we have reached that point and it has come to this. And when you understand the stakes, it's also much easier to fight this war. And obviously I think that Dan is absolutely right that when Israel decided to legitimize the PLO in 1993 and accept the lie that the PLO is a sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people such as they are, that it essentially denied itself, the Jewish state denied itself the ability to make the case for itself uh, and and that has to end as well. And and we see that with uh, you know uh, 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 Yair Lapid's claim that anti-Semitism is just another form of hatred, and it's no different from Hutus and Tutsis who 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 kill each other or or, or any other genocide or any other attempt to uh, 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 discriminate against minorities or slavery in the United States and so on and so forth. And so I think that you know these are times that. Israel and its supporters, Jews and non-Jews in the West have to stand up and say, you know, we stand with Israel and Israelis and the Israeli government has to stand up and say, we stand for our rights and we're going to protect our rights. And everywhere that they're under attack, we're going to defend them. And so um, I hope all of you watching have learned uh, from our discussion today and that you take the point um, that this is a time, um, you know, nobody wants to be in a time for choosing, but we are in one, and maybe we always are. But uh, when so much is at stake, you know, you have to really recognize that if you don't stand up, then you're going to get crushed. Um, and that's what's happening on campuses, and that's what's happening, unfortunately, also in the streets of Israel. And we have to stand up here in Israel and Jews around the world have to stand up uh, where they are. So on that, on that note, and with that battle cry, we're gonna sign up for, sign off for this week. Um, subscribe to the channels at JNS or Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour on YouTube, on Rumble, on Snap, on, I don't know, all of them, uh, Spotify, everywhere. And uh, tell your friends, share this information. I think it's absolutely essential that we all understand what's going on. And I'll just bid a final farewell to Avi Bell, Professor Avi Bell, and to uh, Mr. Dan Diker, uh, both experts on all things related to, well, all things related to Jews and so much more. So thank you both for joining me today. It was a real pleasure and we'll have you back soon. Thank, thank you, you Carol. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Avi. Terrific. All right, take care. Bye-bye.